Hello and good afternoon. You're all very welcome to CETA's Regional Virtual Week. This is day two and my name is Suzanne Purcell. I'm General Manager of CETA for those of you who don't know me. I just want to give you, as we have a number of people who have never attended our events before and especially that we are virtual, I just wanted to say a quick hello to all very welcome. And for those of you who aren't familiar with CETA, CETA is around just over 20 years now and we deliver high quality events and training activities. For those who are interested in membership, membership of CETA is open to everybody. You're all more than welcome. And as membership will provide you an opportunity to attend monthly breakfast events, the annual conference and CETA Skillnet's training courses. You'll receive a discount off those and a discount off the annual conference. And we're delighted to announce that funding for CETA Skillnet's training network has been secured by Skillnet Ireland for 2021. And just in relation to 2021, sorry, in relation to 2021, the number of events that we are running will be the same as the events that we have run in 2020. So the digital transformation series, you've got the technology trend series, the regional event series, similar to what we're on today, and then the BIM gathering conference is what the annual conference in 2021 will be on. All of these events are recorded. All of these events are on the CETA YouTube channel. So for those of you who haven't subscribed yet, go on to YouTube, subscribe to CETA's YouTube channel. If you search for Construction IT Alliance, you'll be able to find that there. And we'd be delighted to have you on board and that'll give you notifications as when all of the new videos are released from any of the events that we are running. So I'm going to hand you over now to Emma Hayes from Digital Build Consultants, who is going to chair today's session. So thanks a million, Emma. Um, and I'll just talk to you all at the end of the event. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks a million. Now, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Sue said, I'm Emma Hayes, um, and I am going to be chairing uh, the second day of CETA's online regional event week. Um, so you're all very welcome. Um, as you can see, the regional event week is covering um, all areas around Ireland, so Dundalk, Belfast, Limerick, Cork, Waterford, Galway, Sligo, and Athlone. Um, we have a full agenda today. Um, with lots of excellent speakers. So I'll introduce each speaker before they present. Um, and uh, without further ado, I am going to hand over to uh, Trevor, uh, Trevor McSharry. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, let uh, Trevor start sharing his screen. And in the meantime, I am going to introduce Trevor to you. So Trevor is Head of Department of Civil Engineering and Construction at IT Sligo since 2011, and is passionate about bridging the gap between education and industry through collaboration. He has led the development of Ireland's largest suite of construction-related online part-time educational programmes, which includes industry partners such as Irish Water, the Department of Transport, and the, C, uh, uh, the SCSI. He's a chartered engineer, certified project management professional, and holds an MBA with DCU Business School. As a director with Lean Construction Ireland, Trevor's research interests include project and quality management, lean and process optimization. Trevor is undertaking a doctorate in education with a leadership specialism. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Trevor and I'll ask you to write any questions that you may have for Trevor in the chat box, which I'll keep, uh, I'll monitor. So thanks, Trevor. Thank you very much Emma, for the introduction. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to cover uh, an overview of the Department of Civil Engineering and Construction at IT Sligo, just to, to set the scene and give some background. Uh, then look at uh, the digital technologies that we've embedded in our programs, uh, both full-time and online programs, and then pull out some of the key program offerings that we have in this particular uh, area, followed by a conclusion. 
So first of all, uh, just to introduce you to the Department of Civil Engineering and Construction, um, we have professional accreditation with all of our programmes from SESI, um, Engineers Ireland, uh, CIOB and SIWEM. So uh, it's an, an important credential so that the students have international uh, accreditation and transferability. Over the last number of years, we've also been successful in collaborating with uh, key national bodies such as Transport Infrastructure Ireland uh, with road safety, uh, Irish Water with uh, water and wastewater treatment plant operations, and the local authority services national training group in the Department of Transport in terms of road maintenance engineering and network management. And more recently, we've collaborated with the SESI for property services and facilities management, as well as uh, mechanical and electrical quantity surveying. So the idea is that uh, by working together, we're able to develop bespoke programs that industry need, and then we're able to work together in terms of recruitment. So this is uh, an overview diagram of our full-time programs at IT Sligo. And starting on the right, we have quantity surveying and construction economics from level six to level uh, eight, uh, accredited with SCSI. In the middle, we have um, kind of carpentry and joinery based programs and construction project management and applied technology. Uh, accredited with CIOB and SCSI. And then over to the left, we have civil engineering uh, from level six all the way up to level 10 uh, at research. And again, accredited with Engineers Ireland. So lots of progression opportunities there and a full spectrum available to the full-time students. From a part-time student perspective, we've developed a, a very broad range of programs from level six to level nine as well. Um, and starting on the right, we have level six to level nine in uh, quantity surveying and specializing in M&E uh, in uh, level nine. In the middle there, we have construction management through to um, level nine, a master's in project management. And then over to the left, there's a number of bespoke programs that we developed uh, with industry, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, in the Northwest region, we have a lot of collaboration with uh, local companies in the area. Um, and I suppose with the intention of promoting uh, the construction sector and also BIM and the utilisation of technologies. And that group, I suppose, were involved in our last event, which was March 2020 before COVID. Uh, and it was the first CETA and Lean Construction Ireland uh, event that we had at IT Sligo. And again, it was very successful. It was focusing on the use of uh, 3D digitisation to improve the productivity of the construction sector, including lean thinking and uh, BIM. So moving on to digital technologies that we use in our programs. So in summary, um, Revit is, I suppose, a core part of the design 3D software that we use, and it's embedded across our programs. We also use uh, Civil 3D for our civil related programs, and Navis works then for viewing and clash detection. We also use SOLIDWORKS in uh, one of our programs for furniture and small product um, design. And then there's a lot of uh, 3D viewing software and scheduling software, such as Asda Power Project BIM, which combines project scheduling uh, with uh, the 3D model and working through the built process. So we have 4D planning. Uh, BuildSoft is used in our quantity surveying programs for 3D takeoff. And Bluebeam is something we've just started to use in our ME in quantity surveying program for um, collaboration and data management. So that's a, an overview of the core uh, packages that we use relating to um, BIM. Um, I suppose also we're looking at uh, virtual and augmented reality, trying to promote the, the, that technology and also to promote the sector. And it's a fantastic way to engage with students uh, and kids and hopefully the future generations entering the construction sector. So we have a HTC Vive for virtual um, reality, which is um, always a hit with the kids. And also we got a new toy last year, which is the Tremble XR10 uh, with HoloLens 2. And we're just coming to terms with the capability of that. And again, a really exciting package. And unfortunately, since March, uh, we haven't been able to use it uh, as much as we, we would like. But um, we have the technology and I suppose we aim to promote that technology and excite the learner uh, with that technology and I suppose open their mind to the potential. Another important development over the last year is we collaborated with the building research uh, establishment in the UK who are now based in Dublin and we have developed um, a relationship with them where our students are eligible to get the BIM AG or approved graduate program. 
And in that program, there's 12 units uh, or 12 lectures. And once the student does those 12 lectures and has to have the background in BIM, they can demonstrate um, their BIM experience and then get certification with BRE. So it's a, it's a recognized certificate uh, from a BIM perspective. So that allows them to walk away with a certificate as well as their qualification at IT Sligo. So that's going quite well and it's proven very popular with students. So looking at the key programs that we have um, on top of the overview that I gave for our full-time and online offerings, uh, an important program that we have uh, running since 2017 is the Postgrad Cert in BIM and Lean Construction Management, which pulls together key um, efficiency uh, topics such as BIM and Lean and project management. And you can see the, the number of modules there from project planning, uh, BIM, Lean Construction, through to project implementation and project simulation, which is a, a kind of a games-based um, activity where the student runs their own project, manage the schedule, scope and uh, and the budget. And that program progresses to a master's in project management and has been springboard approved this year. So we have a, a large number of uh, learners on that program fully funded, which is great. Another exciting development is um, this month, actually, we're looking to get validation of a new certificate in digital construction technology, which is a level seven program. And uh, the semester one modules would be BIM fundamentals, industrial buildings, construction technology, and building services. In semester two would be BIM and collaboration, um, commercial construction technology and site surveying. So we pulled out the core modules that we feel will fit nicely into a certificate, a special purpose award in digital construction technology. And that program uh, will have um, a progression path to the BSc in construction management. So just to conclude, um, we have embedded all of our all of the digital technologies into our programs over the last number of years, and that took a lot of effort from staff upskilling uh, to trialing software and getting it embedded into our programs through the programmatic review process, which happened last year. Uh, and we also have uh, certification from uh, BRE in our programs as well, which is very uh, attractive to the students. Um, I've given an overview of the broad program ranges that we have from a full time perspective and an online perspective, which are part-time online, so it's, they're ideal for uh, people in industry looking to upskill. And we have the largest suite of programs from a part-time online perspective uh, in the construction sector. The programs are professionally accredited, which is a really important credential, and we've developed a, a really strong uh, base of uh, staff expertise, and our graduates are very well respected. And our programs have excellent transfer and progression opportunities. So I'd like to thank you very much for the time to, to um, go through this presentation. And I know we're going to cover questions at the end with Emma. Thank you, Emma. Thanks very much, Trevor. Um, a very comprehensive suite of full and part-time uh, courses at IT Sligo. Um, and really interesting to see um, the exciting developments in BIM and digital uh, construction courses. So thanks for, for sharing that with us. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over now to Connie Scheel, who is going to share his screen. Um, uh, Connie is the lead BIM manager with Scott Talon Walker, and he's going to talk about BIM and tendering. As you're sharing your screen there, Connie, I'll give you your full introduction. So um, I'll just stop sharing my video now. Um, so Connie is a very well presented, highly experienced, ambitious and self-motivated individual with an expansive and progressive design and management career within the greater architectural design, construction and manufacturing industries, both national and international. He has attained senior BIM design and project management level experience while working on various world-class projects. For example, um, the, the UK UCLH Proton Beam Hospital London, uh, the 2022 Al Rayyan World Cup Stadium, uh, London Google HQ at King's Cross, um, and exclusive UK Parliament Estates Buildings refurbishment, um, where he was involved in 3D scan to BIM and some um, fine uh, Dubai hotels. Connie has acquired a certified knowledge of information management within BIM with the capability of leading a team company towards certification in compliance with PAS 1192 or ISO 19650. While covering the role of overall BIM lead and UK and uh, Ireland BIM project manager, 
Connie is also covering many other individual project BIM roles, such as project information manager, task information manager, as defined in PASS 1192. Connie has worked collaboratively uh, mid uh, late 2018 with both the Irish and UK offices of Scott Tallam Walker Architects, successfully setting up the entire company, both UK and Ireland, to achieve BSI uh, BIM Level 2 certification um, compliance. Scott Tallam Walker Architects were successfully awarded BSI certification through yearly BIM audits from the design and construction of BIM Level 2 projects in line with PASS 1192 Part 2 by the British Standards Institute from 2018. Currently, Connie is transitioning the entire Scott Tallam Walker architectural practice from PASS 1192 to ISO 19650. And I'll now hand you over to uh, Connie um, for his presentation. Thanks, Connie. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, good afternoon all. Um, here I will present you with an insight into BIM and tendering in the context of the ISO 19650 series. This is just a general overview given the time constraints and um, focusing on areas of documents involved in BIM tendering, plus a look at some very valuable uh, UK guidance documentation. I will be going through these slides pretty quickly, although this presentation, like all presentations, will be shared afterwards in PDF format. Um, take note, some slides will be solely for uh, future referencing and reading for yourself in some bedtime reading maybe which I will be not going through in detail at all. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, right, very quick introduction to myself. Um, apart from what was introduced earlier, thank you. Um, Scott Helm I'm a BIM lead at Scott Helm Walker Architects and just a couple of examples of quite large BIM projects that I've had the pleasure to work on throughout the years. Um, I won't go into, into any detail on them to be fair. Um, right. Okay, BIM time, well, timeline really. Um, this is a UK based um, timeline presenting a clear understanding of BIM related standards that were implemented and that evolved throughout the years. I'm not going to go through this, but this is a, actually, you probably have seen this plenty of times before. It's a brilliant reference to know when standards were implemented and the, the ever changing standards up to next year. Um, Right, so BIM standards, right. Um, as a lot of you will already be aware, the UK standards BS 1192 and PAS 1192-2 2013 have been withdrawn. Um, with their general context reflected in the latest international standards, ISO 19650-1 and ISO 19650-2. Plus, you'll see an example there of UK transition guidance documentation. Um, on existing projects, these withdrawn standards are still fine to remain for the duration of the project. So BS 1192 and PAS 1192 are still fine. Um, new, pro new projects, however, are recommended uh, to commence using ISO 19650. So it is best to get familiar with the ISO 19650 series. Now, the use of either PAS 1192 or ISO 19650 will be reflected in the requirements of the client, which is now the appointing party. And this is at tender stage. So really the exchange information requirements, EIR, should dictate what standards are applicable to the project by the appointing party. Um, right, so now here are some very, very, very valuable guidance documentation. Um, just four that I have highlighted here. Um, so, and there's a website link there on the bottom for you that you can go to all of those documents. I think there probably is more or less 10 there or something like that. The two on the right are more recent ones. Um, September 2020, Part D and Part E, um, not to be mixed up with TGD, um, which are also very valuable and relevant. Um, most of what you need to know about ISO 19650-1 and 2 are detailed here in all of these documents. They're absolutely brilliant. Um, Quite a few of the extracts I have in the following slides will have come from these documents. So you'll see them all referenced uh, reasonably accurately. Um, so transition PAS 1192 to ISO 19650. For those of you previously familiar with and delivering projects in line with PAS 1192-2, this slide will be of more importance. Again, 
this is one of the slides for future referencing and for the reading for yourselves. We don't necessarily need to go through in too much detail. Um, right, ISO 19650 terminology alterations. Now these are these are key to become extremely familiar with. Um, some terminology changes from BS 1192 and PAS 1192 to ISO 19650. Some of these alterations are key and well worthwhile becoming familiar with. I will not be going in through these in any individual detail. They're there for your further referencing and reading, right? But there, there will be valuable reference, no doubt. Um, right, one thing that should be covered in ISO 19650 is parties, right? And here's a breakdown of the main parties in a project. You're going to need to fully understand these parties and their functions, okay? It's vital. Probably best for you to to further use this for further reading and referencing, and we continue on to the separate slides dedicated to each party, which I have broken down in good detail. So, appointing party, okay? Here we now have the initial party, appointing party, which is the client, okay? So the appointing party is the client. Um, so this slide then covers the appointing party activity focus. Here we have a breakdown of the clauses relevant to the appointing party from ISO 19650-2. On the left column, you will see the clause references with the activities listed in the center column. And in the right column, we have the intensity of the activity. I've highlighted the top two with a little service item, clauses to go through a little more detail in the following two slides. These two are key to, to get correct from the start assisting an appointing party with communication and correct tendering information to prospective appointed parties. Okay, I know there's a lot to be taken in, but this is all going to be here for your reference and later. Appointing party, activities and outputs. Here there is a focus on clause 5.1 with a complete breakdown in the image to the right of the key clauses relevant to this party. Again, for further referencing. Although I have a recommendation there for 5.1.7 regarding the project CDE. It's actually, it's vital that the CDE um, being a very secure way of sharing project information is there from the onset. It is vital. So appointing party, invitation to tender. So um, here the focus on clause 5.2 covering the invitation to tender and associated documents. Now, Take careful note here of clause 5.2.1. Establish the appointing party parties exchange information requirements, EIR. So that was previously known as employer's information requirements, which now is be much better word, exchange information requirements, EIR. Still exists very much so. Now this will be covered in a little more detail in the following slides. Um, the EIR is fundamental to facilitate clear communication at tender stage of the requirements of the appointing party. Absolutely vital. Um, so now here we're going to the EIR in a little more, de a little more detail. Uh, see relevant clause references at the top, and they're just there for your reference, which will be valuable. It is essential that this has got right and is in everybody's best interest. This does require time, resources, and possibly some external influence, thus associated costs. Um, but it's vital. Um, it's the key document at Tinder stage as part of the Tinder documentation. Now, here is the typical thing no EIR made available. I know it's probably a question a lot of people are going to ask towards the end. So, realistically, in some instances, there is no EIR provided, which, to be fair, is improving very well, although there are still many instances where no EIR is provided at least not initially, or without further painful requests, which is often the case. Don't be hesitant. This is the key thing. Don't be hesitant. Go back and submit a response for further information at Tinder stage. Um, you need to seek this out and make the appointing party aware that without the IR, the project will not be following ISO 19650. Okay? If it still remains that you have no EIR and you need to progress with your tender, you will need to still submit a pre-appointment pre BEP, taking into consideration the possibility of one of an EIR becoming available at a later stage, which could well happen. So in fairness, plenty of caveats and cover yourself, right? That's vital. Uh, see the image below on the bottom um, with the EIR in the center? 
without the IR, how can you respond correctly with there being scope gaps down the line, right? So if it's not dictated to you the exact requirements of the appointing party in the form of an EIR, how can you know how to respond in your BEP, your pre-appointment BEP? There will be scope gaps, there's no doubt. There'll be confusion and there will be communication breakdown, which is unfortunate. Um, so prospective lead and lead appointed party, right? This is an area that quite a few of you may well fall into. Example, architects uh, for design stage, construct, constru or contractor for construction stage. Um, so we'll go on to the next one. Uh, prospective lead appointed party. You're, you're regarded as prospective lead appointed party at pre-tender stage, okay? This is the difference, prospective and then lead appointed party. So your lead appointed party post contract award, right? Without going into great detail here, the key document in your pre-appointment BEP, sorry, in your pre-appointment is the BEP, right? This is crucial that you get the detail directly responding to all the content of the EIR, right? Everything has to be responded to, while also referencing clauses where appropriate from the ISO 9650 series. Same as you always did with PAS, really, to a certain degree, right? This document could well influence your chance of winning a tender. And to be fair, it should. It should be properly properly done. Um, so tender response, this is contained from the previous one. Here you have a detailed image of the associated clauses from 19, ISO 19650 on your right there, little star beside it there, um, which will be covered in the following slide, pre-appointment BEP. Assessing the delivery team BIM capability and capacity is another key area in determining your approach to achieving delivering timely project deliverables to be summarized in a statement of capability and capacity. And then you have mobilization plan and risk register, another two. But we'll, we'll go into the, the BEP in a little tiny more detail now. So BIM execution plan, pre-appointment, tender stage. Here you have uh, seven key information management considerations that should be addressed in your pre-appointment BEP. So it was in PAS 1192, it was known as pre-contract BEP, okay? Ideally, you should have a pre-appointment BEP template created for your company, or everybody should, which should then be tweaked to reference a project-specific EIR. Now, in the odd case, as part of your EIR, the um, appointing party will dictate the very documentation that you should submit, and maybe even provide you with a template. But that's, in most cases, that is not that doesn't happen. It's documented, but it doesn't necessarily happen. So you can use your own uh, your own template that you should have ready to go. Um, so lead appointed party appointment award. So congrats, you've been awarded the contract and you are now the project lead appointed party. So right, perspective is gone from this now. You've been lucky. Um, here again, you will see a detailed image on the, of the clauses related to this stage on the right. Um, your initial task now is to draft the project BEP, right, for the entire project team, delivery team. See again, uh, relevant clauses referenced here. Okay. Um, so, BIM execution plan, post appointment. Unfortunately, no time to sit back or party, um, as much as we would like to. Um, you have a lot to get cracking on with. Uh, see list of clauses and, and activities in the following slide. Okay. So, the following slide. Here you have all the clauses and activities of post um, appointment award. So mobilization, that's what it's known as. Uh, another detailed reference slide that I've included here, um, we'll not go through it in detail, this is for your future referencing and reading. Uh, there are a number of documents you need to get sorted at this stage, see list, um, that's basically the list. Uh, we'll go through the BEP now um, in a little more detail next. Excuse me, I am flying through this, but we are time conscious. Um, so, appointed party, uh, testing. Okay, here we now have the appointed party. Examples of the appointed party would be, God knows, m &E, structure, facade, landscape, any specialists in that area, right? So that's who you're talking about, appointed party. Um, number of primary actions here listed and the relevant clauses as the appointed party that you need to carry out for the duration of your appointment. Um, again, 
some very valuable referencing there. Um, so proposed CD. Now we're we're coming to, we're coming towards the end, but I wanted to put in something on the common data environment, um, as it is vital, it is most important, and you must be must be carefully considered type and suitability to both the project and the entire team. So like some will go BIM 360 docs. Yes, there's a lot of associated costs with it, but how suitable is it? It needs to be carefully considered. Um, so any type of CD needs to get needs to have serious consideration. And of course, depending on your pointing parties requests and um, security may be a major issue, maybe, but it will be it there will be security certification with most CDs anyhow. Um, so pro all project information, right, any and all project information should pass through the CD for sharing in a secure manner, right. The idea of um, sharing stuff via emails and all that shouldn't be happening. It should be all going through the CD in proper management, right? Okay, the one thing you'll say is time constraint, it's everything, but that's where it should be shared, right? Because if the information manager or whatever then will will um, check it for for uh, quality and sees it in line with the the um, the BEP and um, the SMP, Standards, Methods and Procedures, was it all according to what was dictated? Somebody has to check it. Um, now, we'll continue on then to some Irish um, BIM resources. Okay, so you, you see here on your left-hand side the RIAI BIM pack, um, 2019. Um, an ISO equivalent of this BIM pack will be issued reasonably shortly, probably New Year now. Um, but that's an incredible document, incredible. Um, it really is, it clearly states how everything should be delivered, what you have to deliver, there's templates even available. It's it's amazing. If you don't know about it, my God, check it out. RIAI BIMPAC. Now that at the moment is PAS 1192 compliant, right? But it will be shortly updated to ISO 19650. I think it's it's an amazing. You are not You are not at all on your own. Right, a lot of documentation you find is all UK based and everything, but this is your your Irish equivalent, no doubt about it. And the other reference there is to the the Irish um, equivalent of ISO one nine six five zero. So it is labelled as ISEN, whereas the British one is BSEN, and so on. Right. So that's that's your reference um, to the documentation for future works. Okay, guys, um, that's the end. Um, I know I did fly through it, but there's a lot of stuff there for reading later on when you get an opportunity. And thank you very much for listening, and thank you to CETA um, for allowing me to present here today. Okay. Thank you very much, Connie, and thank, thank you, you for sharing your uh, excellent knowledge and experience of implementing ISO 19, 19650 on projects. In particular, um, I think you've given an awful lot of clarity to the functions and the responsibilities of the the, the, the parties involved in um, implementing uh, mm. ISO 19650 on a project um, and some really great resources there that you've shared as well. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome and thank you. Um, yeah, I had to rush through it, but yes. Yeah, it's, there's a lot there. It's been all the end, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> and there will be time for some Q&A at the end of the, the session today if anybody wants to type any questions for Connie in the chat. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Willie Flynn, uh, who can start sharing his screen whenever he's ready. I'm going to turn my video off uh, and I will introduce Willie. Uh, so Willie has been dealing with, uh, so Willie is the sales manager with uh, SIS. Um, he's been dealing with different sectors of the construction industry for over 30 years. For the last 20 years, he's been involved in the selling and hiring of Lekia uh, survey equipment with survey instruments services. The vast range of projects in his portfolio include Lekia Robotic Total Station, uh, Lekia GPS, uh, Lekia 3D Scanners, um, uh, Pegasus Mobile Mapping, and I'm sure uh, Willie will go into more detail uh, in his presentation about those. Uh, and his duties include doing on-site practical demonstrations and technical support to their ever-expanding customer base. So I'll now hand you over to Willie.
I think you might still be muted, Willie, if you want to unmute your mic. Am I loud and clear? Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, okay, thank away. you. Thanks. Okay, apologies. Thank you, Emma, for your introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I represent Survey Instrument Services. We've been associated with CTIF for a large number of years as a valued sponsor. Um, I'm going to talk today about Leica Digital Data Collection, but first, a short overview of who we are. Survey Instrument Services was established in 1973 by John Carfrey. We are distributors of Leica Geosystems Surveying Equipment. We also have the agency for PIX 4D, DGI drones, and Tiny Marking Robot. Leica Geosystems is a world leading capture solution provider based in Switzerland. SIS are the longest established survey equipment supplier in Ireland. We are based in Dublin, but we also have a regional office in Cork. This slide gives us an overview of some of the clients that we supply equipment to. Um, including government bodies, which part of OSI, Defence Force and Irish Water, local authorities, including Dublin City Council, Mayo County Council, Galway County Council, to name but a few, construction companies, including PJ Hegarty's, Walls, Monomy, Kilcawley, survey companies, including Murphy Geospatial, Apex Service PCA, consulting engineers, civil engineers, a whole gamut of um, clients and companies that will be involved in the wider construction industry and um, we're also delighted to be involved and um, providing educational third level educational and um, including gmit at loan it and enu uh, with equipment to it, it let the students expand and see what's like a have to operate going forward this little screen here gives an overview of some of the products that i'm going to dis discuss today under like a digital data capture, we have a range of different solutions. For robotic and GPS integrated solutions, we have the Captivate series of instrumentation, including the MS60, the TS16, and the GS18i. For mobile mapping solutions, we have the Pegasus series, including the Pegasus 2, which is a vehicle mounted unit, and the Pegasus backpack. For 3D scanning, we have the P40 scanner, which collects 1 million points per second, the RTC360 scanner, which collects 2 million points per second, and the Leica BLK360, which is the lightest and smallest scanner, collecting only a small number, 360,000 points per second. Also, we have a range of handheld devices. Within the construction sector, for BIM solutions, many companies are now using the latest ICON robotic total station generation, where IFC files can be uploaded directly onto loggers basically allowing you to upload and visualize your construction data on site. Um, what you're seeing there on the screen is a Panasonic Topwood logger. And I'm just gonna play a little video which shows a file that has been uploaded onto the logger. And then from there, a point now is going to be set out from the logger. So the engineer is selecting a point and now the instrument is going to direct him to that point and you can see he's been directed towards the center of the circle which is the point that we want to set out from the drawing and as soon as you get the green light the point is stored and accepted and now we have that point validated on site so it just gives a quick overview there of how a file is loaded onto a controller and then we're able to go and the next product that i'm going to talk about is the like a gs18 i it's the latest innovative GPS unit from Leica. Um, it's a versatile survey, accurate and easy to use GNSS or TK rover. What is very special about this, it's got a camera built into the antenna. So it uses highly innovative visual technology based on seamless integration of GNSS, IMU and a camera. This enables you to measure points in survey grade accuracy from images, either in the field or in the office. Alternatively, you can create points from point clouds from captured images using like Infinity software to expand possibilities even further. This has been designed for surveying professionals to measure points which pre previously could not be measured without by a standard GPS rover because of either accuracy or locality. I mentioned earlier about the like a BLK 360 scanner, which, as you can see there from the image, is saying the smallest and lightest imaging scanner available. 
Um, it captures you full 360 in full color foreign dynamic images overlaid on a high accuracy point cloud. It's very simple to use with a single push of one button. Anyone can operate who can operate an iPad can now capture the world around them with this height based scanner. And you will see later how the scanner is using an iPad using either Recap Pro or like his own internal like Cyclone Field Sofa. And that will be explained in the video that you will see later. Um, originally, when the Leica BLK scanner was manufactured a few years ago, it was in, also in partnership with Autodesk. And Autodesk developed a, an app. They already had the desktop Recap Pro software. So they developed an app that could sit on an iPad and then that would drive the BLK. Unfortunately for um, some of our customers, Autodesk are um, disbanding with that mobile app, not supporting it from next year. So Leica have developed a Cyclone Field software that will now drive the BLK going forward. But last year, this scanner that I'm showing you now is the Leica RTC 360 scanner has been the main scanner um, that we have either for hire or for sale. It's gathering the most interest. It can, the Leica RTC 3D Vitality Capture solution empowers users to document and capture their environments in 3D, improving efficiency and productivity in the field and in the office through fast, simple to use, accurate and portable hardware and software. The 3D scanner is a solution for professionals to manage project complexities with accurate and reliable 3D representation and discover the possibilities of any site. It's highly portable, highly automated, intuitive, and designed for maximum productivity. The RTC solution efficiency and effectively combines with the RTC 360 high performance scanner with the Leica Cyclone Field 360 software for edge computing for automatically registering scans in real time. Capture scans with HDR imagery in less than two minutes. Automatically record your moves from station to station to pre-register your scans in the field without any manual intervention. Augment your data capture with information tags, illustrating the opportunities for better planning, reflect site reality, and boost your team's situational awareness. How this is special is that the VIS is a VIS technology, and it was, when it was done, it was painted to this particular unit. It's based on five cameras built into the RTC to track the environment. These cameras pick up on the environmental features and use them as reference points to connect individual scans. When moving from one place to another, even without floors, even between floors, I should say, the RTC knows the relevant position between the two, any two scans and automatically registers the different point clouds into one complete point cloud. There is no user interaction needed. Points are discreetly identified, tracked dynamically, and the same points are used to calculate the new scan location. These cameras are infrared and can be used in low light. This is a quick video explaining. So when the scan is completed, you want to bring it into your software. So while scanning with the RTC 360 solution, users can operate their laser scanners and perform on-site point cloud pre-registration straight from any ISO or Android device through the Cyclone Field mobile app that's either on your phone or on the iPad. With this intuitive user interface and immediate data visualization, Cyclone Field 360 app allows users to quality control their scans directly in the field. Using fast USB data transfer to PC, data can be imported into Cyclone Register 360 Office Software to integrate your 3D model seamlessly into your workflow. And also now I'm just going to give you a short video again of the process happening. So this is like, like a Cyclone Register 360. So like I have had all, always with their scanners for their P range and um, have always had the Cyclone software and it's one of the most powerful 3D software packages in the world. 
and it can be used with any any scanners. But this little video it just gives an outline of where a project has been created and the data has been imported onto the, into the software. And so when it says smart align, it's going to be just aligning the software and um, the, the images there that you've taken it and then it's based on targets and all these little yellow triangles that you're seeing there on the screen are all setups that would have been done with the scanner. So there would have been numerous setups around the site at different locations. And we're able to, when it says auto alignment, it knows certain points from the Viz technology that is able to say that point was common to that point, that point was common to that point. And then it matches those and it's auto aligning all the different points. As you can see then, it also optimizes. So we can see that whether you do two scans or a hundred scans, you can actually just tie it all in. If you didn't have auto alignment, you can actually do manual alignment. So again, this is here where there's just a slight, only millimeters, and it's just been aligned in to optimize, to make sure again that everything is corrected um, because some sites can be more complex than other sites. And again, you can see from there it's saying 51 additional scans found. And again, it would give us errors if there's any errors, and it also tells us what type of accuracy um, can be achieved using that software. And with Register 360, you can do up your reports, but then you can also export it into, uh, sorry, just be, I'm really running myself. Um, this is a slice of a site. So again, anyone that is involved in 3D modeling software or anything, sometimes you might have to just do a slice of a site. Just just give you a quick overview again, where you can actually just do, and again, as a standard, you can take measurements um, on from, from the software, but that will be all standard. So I'll leave the, so this is a fly mode. So again, this is just a fly through of this particular site where you can just, again, some of you would have been used to using different 3D software packages in the past. So you can actually just walk through and pick any point that might be, or an indication that might be of interest to you. And again, when there's on about color mode, you can see, you can either have it in cloud data or you can set out have it from, from picture quality. And you can see there, that's the intensity, color intensity, depending on what we've actually just scanned. So that just gives an overview of Cyclone 360 software. It's very powerful. You can export there from that software then into a particular package that you may be using already yourself. Um, but it's, it's dynamic and it's very impressive. The next device that we're going to talk about is just mobile mapping solutions. And within mobile mapping, there's three options. There's a backpack, there's Pegasus 2, which is a, mo or a mobile mapping one that uh, is mounted onto a vehicle, and then there's the stream. So it, just to give you an overview, right, we are going to talk about first about the backpack. So with the backpack, it has five cameras, two laser scanners, and an IMU system, along with a GPS antenna for getting high accuracy positional data out on site. This system can also map inside and uses a technology called SLAM. Large scale reality capture for asset feature attraction in urban environment is now made simpler. We can combine this data from a Pegasus backpack with aerial data from the OS or from data taken from UAVs to give a complete data set of our towns and cities like we've never had before. And this just gives a small little overview of some data set samples um, that can be taken. So you can see it's been used in forestry applications, electrical substations, in disaster zones, not here in Ireland, but so um, earthquake zones and everything. And then from topographically, from a digital terrain modeling perspective. There are a number of vehicle mounted mobile mapping systems in the market, but the Leica Pegasus 2 is the first complete mobile mapping system available from one manufacturer. This is completely vehicle independent make it a complete solution across multiple applications without limiting to either road or rail. The Leica Pegasus 2 mobile map solution uses one or several scanners in combination with GNSS receivers, IMU and optional DMI to acquire accurate, precise spatial data with 68 cameras on any vehicle. Again, this gives a quick overview of where um, it can be used. As you can see, it's road, beach, rail and sea. Um, on the slides there, you can actually see that we've actually um, have it on a couple of our vehicles and it can be taken off and put on at any one stage, that, depending where, where it needs to be used. 
reason that mobile mapping has come into play in a lot in the last couple of years here in Ireland in particular is that traditionally people would have gone out with GPS or total stations and there would have been you know, a large number of people going out. So there's definitely a cost saving involved when you use a mobile mapping um, because they, they include, there's no traffic management required, there's no travel for a large number of surveyors, so labourers cut down and you, know, you don't have to go back to the site because you pick up everything on the one one visit. So these, been, these savings benefit both large and small companies alike, as larger companies can deliver more projects to a higher standard of detail than previously, while allowing companies with less resource tender on larger projects by implementing the latest technology. So that was just a quick overview of some of the like products that we have. Um, Joe, so I could spend all day discussing the, the advantages and disadvantages of, of, well, there's only advantages with Leica of all the product range. Um, my last slide is just going to be on a little video, it's only last for only, of data that we actually collected um, with the Pegasus. And um, it was a recent project uh, that took place in the Greater Dublin area, undertaken by PCA using our mobile mapping unit, where we provide the support and training for the entire project. The data shown was collected as part of a large scale topographical survey for the National Transport Authority over 1.5 kilometers in under 30 minutes. The data along the route was captured in two passes with the unit set to position two for the first and position four for the second. The two passes in both positions created a diamond pattern with minimal gaps from parked car street furniture. So you can just see from the video, it's just doing a sweep now. Um, so with the, the mobile map, you can actually drive at up to 80 kilometers an hour. Um, so this is a bit quicker than 80 kilometers an hour, but it's, uh, it just gives you an overview. And that's it. And thank you for your time. And again, if there's any questions, you can pass them on to him in the after. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Every time I see uh, uh, an update from Leica, I'm always blown away by um, how sophisticated the, the technology is getting. The quality of the graphics is absolutely incredible. Um, yet, all of the tools are really user friendly, so um, it's it's really amazing to see what's happening in the the three D scanning and the um, laser scanning uh, part of of the industry. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and I suppose CETA is all about connecting you to innovation, and I think um, you've just done that with your presentation uh, this afternoon, really. So thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, our last speaker for this afternoon. Um, who is Sophia Pasparakis. Uh, Sophia, if you want to share your screen there, if you have uh, presentation slides, um, I'll turn my video off and give you a chance to share your screen. Uh, and I'll also give you a full introduction as well. So, um, uh, Sophie is an architect with Pasparakis Friel Architects um, and is also a part-time lecturer um, at Letterkenny IT. Sophie studied architecture at the SORH in Heidelberg in Germany. In 2009, Sophie joined Grimshaw Architects in London, where she worked on a range of products, uh, projects, including Heathrow Terminal 2B and Oman Botanic Gardens. In 2018, she moved from London to Rathmullen in Donegal and set up Pasparakis Friel with uh, her partner Ronan Friel. The Architecture Studio provides architecture, master planning and interior design services through all stages of design and building process. Um, she's currently lecturing on a variety of modules, including BIM graphic communications um, part time at Letterkenny Institute of Technology. So I'll now hand you over to Sosie. Thanks, Sosie. Hi, thanks, Emma, for the introduction and thank you to CETA 
for um, inviting me to present today. So today I will be sharing two brief presentations. The first will be a refresher on our methods of teaching BIM at LYT, as it was covered in the um, CETA event in May in more detail by my two colleagues. And then I will follow by um, that with an introduction to my private work in practice at Pasparacas Friel. I hope it will be evident in today's presentation that I am passionate about construction innovation and um, you should see some parallels in what we are teaching at LYT and what I am practicing. So just as the recap at LYT, you can see here a selection of the courses we offer full time within the Department of Engineering and Construction. The strength of these courses really lies in the use of current technologies, the lecturers coming from industry and the emphasis on practical experience. We also have two um, part time courses currently running, one which is a Revit introduction course and uh, Navis Works 4D. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Sosie. I don't see your next slide. Maybe it's just me, but I, um, I'm still seeing your, your first Sorry slide. about that. Yeah, can you I see, can it, see now? it now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, Thank there you. seems to be a disconnect. Okay. So, okay, is that working now? Yeah, hopefully. So, um, we feel at LYT it's necessary um, prior to... to delving into the world of BIM and Revit, that the students get a good grasp on CAD and they are introduced that in the first semester. Following the first semester in CAD, we introduce um, BIM graphic communications and the software we use is Revit. The content of the course is an introdu introduction to building information modeling and BIM processes documenting a project using schedules and the principles of the collaboration. And here you can see an example of a student's work where they created a medium-sized model, produced room schedules. Hey, hey Matthias, it's Ray here. Ray, room Hi. schedules. Um, Sorry, I have someone in the background there briefly. Um, room can schedules. Everybody mute their mics, please. Thank you. Um, and legends, whilst learning how to edit families, create new window and door types, as well as creating and editing curtain walls. So once they've dipped their toe, as it were, in the world of um, Revit and BIM, they have the opportunity to work on an integrated project. Uh, we are fortunate at LYIT that we have the following disciplines. So we have architectural technology, civil engineering, construction management, fire safety engineering and quantity surveying. So with these courses, we can create a small design team and run through a simulated project. So this, in this instance, in the top left-hand corner, you can see um, a facility which is close to us here at LYT. It's at Danlan, it's a sports facility, and the students will work in BIM level two, following the necessary protocols and workflows, using re relevant BIM tools such as Revit and Navisworks for clash detection, and um, all of the information published and all communication, all communication occurs in a common data environment, which is BIM 360. This has been a very successful module for all the disciplines. It's a very practical experience and it aids in preparing the students for the workplace. This is especially relevant for the architectural technologists, construction managers, and fire safety engineers who have the opportunity for a work placement where they can use the experience um, and knowledge that they've learned during the integrated project. We, send our, we feel we send our students off armed with the confidence and current skills needed in, in the current um, construction and in the future of construction. And we've been getting fantastic feedback from the practices where they are um, placed during their work placement. And they've become quite crucial members of the team. And they've even encouraged current um, members of the um, workforce in practice to upskill. So we've had people signing up for evening classes here at LYT that have worked with students of ours on work placement. So as I said, um, it's a very brief overview on LYT courses. And um, in terms of just transferring skills, I'd like to share with you 
a presentation um, from private practice. So as you can see at LYT, our department and all disciplines work closely together. And in practice, this is something we are particularly interested in. We believe the results are the best results even come from successful collaborations. Um, we set up our architectural studio, Pasparacus Friel, in Donegal in 2018, after working in Germany, Ireland, the States and the UK where we worked on projects such as this, um, as Heathrow T2B. This project involved a very large design team, as you would expect, and many, many design team meetings. Um, and, the need for, and the need for innovation was at the fore, as was efficiency in both design and implementing construction methods. Uh, we use DFMA where possible and it was paramount to realizing a kilometer, half a kilometer, sorry, long building such as this. We've also been fortunate in having the opportunity to work on rather unique um, projects. Uh, this is the Oman Botanic Garden, which is currently under construction. Here we learned the value of collaboration between engineers and architects. In this instance, the architect, the engineer rather was Arab. So inherent to all the projects we worked on at all scales and sectors was a clear design approach and rationale, which we now apply to all of our own projects at Pasparacus Friel. Whether it be an efficiently designed one-off house or a Napoleonic gun battery on the Loch Swilly, which includes restoration works and a new build museum. All the regeneration master plans and strategies of which some of our current projects go up to 200 hectares. And we're undertaking a couple of these at the moment across the county. So that's an overview and I'd like to take you through um, a specific project in a little bit more detail. We see this as an opportunity for R&D, um, research and development, and we hope following the successful completion of the project that we will roll out these principles um, to our larger projects in the future. So Rock House is located on a rural site overlooking the Loch Swilly. The topography of the site, is, there are steep slopes and a vast amount of uh, mature vegetation, as well as numerous large rock outcrops. This naturally led us to locating the dwelling adjacent to three existing um, outhouses. And this arrangement seeks to preserve the tr traditional rural building cluster in both form and materiality. So now zooming into the um, ground floor plan here, you can see it's quite a modest dwelling of circa 140 square meters. There's a ground floor and a mezzanine level. So as I mentioned, we were adamant to explore alternative construction methods as we could see, um, locally and internationally, um, huge inefficiencies in standard construction methods in the residential sector in particular, so i.e. concrete block. And we wanted to reduce the number of trades both on site and significantly reduce where possible the construction program. We've reviewed a lot of options. Um, uh, from CLT to um, portal frame with Kingspan cassette panels, but we were never truly satisfied with those options and we continued to look for alternatives and um, following con conversations with a light gauge steel contractor, we pursued the principles of a steel house. Sorry, I'm struggling with these slides. So I'm just going to take you through to where we are today, um, starting from the ground up. In keeping with the building methods above ground, we ditched the um, more traditional concrete strip, strip foundation in favor of a fully insulated raft foundation, which removes the cold bridging at the base detail 
And it also means that we minimize excavation, which you can, um, I'm sure you understand, is key on a site full of rock. Um, and it significantly reduces the quantity of concrete required. The underfloor heating will um, be integrated into the raft, and we're actually exploring the option of polishing the slab as a finished floor. So on site, this would be programmed up to uh, one week on site. So following on to the hot rolled frame, which is currently ready for fabrication, it is an efficiently engineered asymmetrical portal frame, which will be erected in two, three, two to three days. This is the fabrication drawing, and um, it's just worth noting that there is not one single concrete block on this building or in this building. Um, following the hot rolled steel, we'll um, install the light gauge steel cassettes, which are set within the plane of the hot rolled elements. Um, all internal, external walls, as well as the mezzanine slab, uh, the mezzanine floor and wall, are um, from light gauge steel. Obviously, here in this um, in this image, you can't see the openings, um, but I'll come to that. So here, uh, an example of one of the fabrication drawings of the light gauge steel um, cassettes. And a section, a section of the cassettes where you can see the cassettes that are in the roof, as well as the openings in the facade and the wall out of light gauge steel as well and the floor for the mezzanine. So just um, for interest's sake, here is one of uh, a fair few, maybe hundreds of um, fabrication drawings, which currently sit on my desk for um, a, a quick review um, of the individual cassette panels. These have been extracted from a 3D model. And then just um, because I thought it was interesting to see the factory setting, um, the drawings will be shared with the manufacturer and they will um, produce the cassettes in, um, a, within a tolerance of one to two mil. And here in the background, you can see a finished cassette in the, the central photo. You can see the steel sections before they've been um, put together as a cassette. And then this last image shows them erected on site. So um, to close it up, the building will be clad in a sinusoidal metal and we are installing um, a aluminium window system. Our choices throughout the projects have, um, from superstructure to the cladding, adopts a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach, i.e. allowing all materials ultimately to be recycled or upcycled. Um, so from, and we feel that um, it is possible from the point of commencing on site to creating a weathertight envelope, it is feasible to realize this within four weeks. Obviously, that is reliant on, um, on timely scheduling of windows, etc. We're very excited with where we are at this time with this project. Comparing it to a typical build, we are looking at a much more efficient construction time, a reduced project, project cost, and approaching passive house standard. So we see great potential um, to apply this method in a variety of projects and sectors, whether it be multi-unit schemes. And we're very happy to um, share the progress. And if you'd like to know more, then um, feel free to contact me and I'll be around for any questions you may have. So um, thank you very much. And um, back over to Emma. Great. Thanks, Sosie. A really, really exciting project and great to see uh, prefabrication and offsite solutions uh, being implemented on a, a residential project. And as you said yourself, there's great opportunity there for, for um, uh, it uh, going forward for other uh, projects like social housing, where you need to, to quickly build and provide uh, solutions. So excellent. Thank you for sharing that. It's also great to see uh, your industry experience being brought to 
um, Letter Kenny um, and, and the courses that you're involved in there. Um, and really exciting that the, the students get to work on a collaborative project in a multidiscipline environment that really does give them um, a taste of, of uh, what it's going to be like in, in real world. So thanks for that. Um, we're now at the Q&A section of the, uh, the session this afternoon, and I'm just going to share uh, my screen so we can um, just look at the, the last slide and see who our sponsors are. Uh, so just bear with me now. I should be sharing my screen there. Um, and I will get the chat box up as well if I can um, to see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, where is the chat box now? Have it now. Uh, so there's actually um, uh, just one question there at the moment um, uh, from Eve. Um, are these images obtained in post-production phase? That question was raised uh, during Sosie's presentation. So um, I, I would imagine it was for your, um, your, your project example that you went through there, Sosie. So would you be able to answer that question? Sorry, um, are these images obtained post-production post phase? phase. So we had uh, the image of um, Heathrow was during construction. The image of Oman Botanic Gardens was um, during concept design. And um, the last one, the Curra, um, was actually a, um, an image of the completed um, building on site. I hope that that covers the, the question. Sounds good to me. Yeah, thanks. Yep, um, Eve says yes, thanks. Um, while I'm waiting for a few more questions to come through on the chat, um, I might just ask a couple of questions myself. So first one be to Trevor. Um, Trevor, your new course in uh, digital construction um, uh, looks like a really interesting um, course. What, um, what kind of roles do you expect the, the graduates from that course will be able to, to take up when they, they graduate from, from uh, IT Sligo? Yeah, so I suppose it's a 30 credit, or sorry, it's about uh, 30 credits, yeah, so it's half of a, a level seven degree program. So it's uh, mainly targeting people looking to upskill with the, the knowledge um, that might already be in uh, a kind of site management supervision role and um, looking to upskill and get familiar with BIM and maybe BIM coordination activities. Um, so that's, I suppose, one of the areas. And then if they want to progress, they can get a full level seven degree then in construction management, which is probably one of our most popular programs in the, uh, the Institute, actually. Um, and typically the backgrounds would be people who have done an apprenticeship at level six. Uh, so they could be coming from an electrical background or carpentry and joinery. Um, or other kind of built environment type um, uh, courses and then they, they feel like they want to get a level seven degree and uh, just to improve their pre-qualification scores and um, they might already be in a supervision role but they don't have a degree behind them um, uh, so so I suppose that's kind of where the, the niche is this will be a feeder for that program uh, so at the moment we don't have that offering available it's a two-year commitment for 60 credits for that degree um, so this program will be a feeder for that and also give flexibility to the learner just to take on the specialist knowledge around the BIM related modules. So there'll be kind of two options really. Okay, super. So you're uh, bridging a, a gap in industry and then also providing uh, further education for, for a, a workforce or, or a skill set. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, my next question is to Connie. Um, Connie, um, you've, you've, um, you've given a lot of um, background information there to the ISO 19650 BIM process. And one of the kind of key points that you made and you highlighted in your presentation was um, the need for an exchange information requirements document um, provided by the appointing party or the client. Um, could you talk a little bit about your experience of, um, of that? And like, are there many projects where you've had uh, received one? And the success of those projects against um, maybe the um, the need where it's missing on some projects. Um, how Certainly, yeah. difference is, is Certainly Emma, yeah, no problem there. Um, yes, like EIR uh, originally known as Employers Information Requirements, now Exchange Information Requirements. 
Um, yeah, it's as I emphasised earlier on, it's the key document. And I'll, on um, a reasonable majority of projects, I've worked internationally on many BIM projects from in the la over the last number of years, and even internationally, um, where BIM has been uh, mandated, um, God knows since 2016, um, EIRs were not becoming available, right? So, um, yes, on a number of projects, it still happens, but the initial thing to do, like in the Tinder doc documentation that's provided by the appointing party, um, that's the first thing to check for EIR, right? If the EIR does not exist, you you stall and you go back and request it, right? Openly if possible, because everybody should be aware of, of the documentation that's being requested. Now, you will get, on some projects, you will get hesitation, right? But um, it's not it's not you was wrong, right? If they have dictated that they want the project delivered to, to either PAS 1192 or ISO 19650, there should be an EIR dictating their requirements very, very clearly. So then in your, your pre-appointment BP, you can state how you intend to or not. You don't have to necessarily agree with it, but your, your BP will dictate how you will uh, propose to deliver everything requested in the EIR. Um, so it's fundamental. Yeah. And now, as I mean, you just said there as well, like how have projects um, progressed where there wasn't one available? There's there's always going to be scope gaps. There's no doubt about it. Um, because there's going to be hesitation as to who who is responsible for what or is that actually required, right? Sometimes you will go over and above your deliverables and sometimes, you, you know, you will because you're not too sure exactly what what is required you can you can you can give the minimum but then a lot of the time further on in the project as the project progresses there's going to be demand for further information because it was never requested in the first place like let's we'll say the likes of um kobe data and it's it's a typical example it, it may not be even a requirement early on in the project or or clearly stated how it should be delivered right and Later on in the project, then there's a big, uh, well, there's some disagreement as to what should be delivered and what the scope is because of time constraints and, of course, costs. So I don't know, does that give you a reasonable insight? Yeah, absolutely, Connie. Thank you. I think yeah. that's really great advice. Um, and I suppose just to summarise, if there isn't an exchange information requirement document when you're tendering for uh, a project um, that is... Uh, being ISO 19650 compliant, then ask for one. Um, so yeah, really good advice. Thanks for that, Connie. That, no problem, because I'll just continue there for a second. Like, what we need to try and do is to make this all business as usual. Yeah. Like, all the BIM documentation, like, in to be fair for people tendering for a project, you know, you're, you're tendering there and you have a massive knowledge of BIM, right? On, on what possibly should be delivered. But yet another person is delivering then or tendering for the project that might have minimal knowledge of BIM, but they're coming in at maybe a possible lower price because they're not including, yep. you know, but anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great advice. Thanks, Connie. No problem, Doug. Um, my next question is to Willie. Um, so, Willie, what do you think has been the big, I suppose, there was a lot of focus about uh, innovation and, and advancements in, in technology with your, um, your uh, Leica um, tools and solutions. What, do you, in, in your opinion, is the biggest game changer in the Leica uh, suite of solutions um, for the, the, the construction industry? See, because it's such a wide range of equipment, right? It it really depends on what avenue or like what areas your expertise or knowledge is in. So, if you're on a construction site, mostly you're setting out buildings, um, job be it commercial or residential. So you're going to be using GPS and topo stations. You come into the M and E sector, and it's more possibly the three D scanning, right? That you'll want to scan something that's there existing. Then that's going to be taken out of the equation, and then that's going to be scanning in to validate. So over the last few years, GPS and total systems, the robotics are always, you know, there's, there's always innovation happening. 
Um, but I suppose the biggest is in the 3D scanning, as Joe, as a lot of my slides in my presentation earlier were regarding 3D scanners, and particularly the RTC 360, that's collecting 2 million points a second. Now, most instrumentation, it collects, if you have a total station, it collects one point, right? This is 2 million points, right? So it's a massive amount of data. Um, and it's only a minute and a half to two minutes to, to capture it, and that includes images, right? So that is probably one of the game changers from a 3D scanning perspective. Um, but what we have found out is that using all this technology that I mentioned earlier, um, from your totalization to your GPS to your 3D scanning, drones are becoming more, um, Joe, I, I wouldn't say popular, because there's always drones, but from a commercial aspect and from a professional, um, you will see a lot more drones being used in the industry, um, because you can only capture what the eyes can see, or an instrument on the ground can only capture, you can't capture what the sky. Um, so it's really drones, I think, in the next maybe three to five years in particular, um, the, the technology in drones, um, because you can buy a drone for 100,000, you can buy a drone for 100 euros, but, but it's really where the drone is going to be about 20,000 that can capture what the 100,000 is doing at the moment. I think that's the future. And then combining all the data sets from drones to UAVs to what you have on the ground with a total station. Um, so like every aspect, I like people that were are, you know, mesmerized over the last 20 years what a total station can do with robotic, but then likewise what a, a 3D scanner can do. And like when I started off with 3D scanners 20 odd years ago, um, it was like a, it was like going to a gym. You need you had muscles, right? A battery alone was nearly ten kilos. Um, now it's less than a bag of sugar. The weight of the BLK. So, so it's electronics. So have improved dramatically. So watch the space, will you? Then we'll be uh, looking for a, an update in in another six to twelve months to to see well, that, how that, even that, more yeah. advanced. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing I would like. Uh, um, like they're a Swiss-based company, and. Um, they're always innovative, like right? that's where they. Right? So they're always trying to be ahead of the curve, right? So like we're looking at equipment out that we we need to fight. They're probably already working on the next installment that will be available in the market in a couple of years' time. Um, so they're trying to think what we're thinking that can help. Um, now we believe what more can they do? But they, they always do something, right? They always do something. Yeah. Super, great. Thanks, thanks for the update. Uh, my you. last question then is to uh, Sophie. Um, so uh, really interesting to hear about an architectural practice who was set up in, in Donegal. And I suppose I'm interested to, to um, maybe understand where um, the construction industry in, in that part of the, the country is in terms of BIM adoption, BIM implementation or digital construction um, methods. What would your um, opinion be of, of where where construction is in in um, that region of the, the country? Um, if it, well, we've been here now for two years, um, and those those construction firms that we've been in contact with are yet to um, implement BIM. Um, that's not to say that there aren't construction firms that are. I think there's a hesitation here. Um, I don't know if it's it's in part driven by small architectural practices are typically still using AutoCAD. Um, there is a hesitancy to um, change to BIM and Revit, um, having to upskill or um, just change current methods of working. Uh, that will happen, I think, um, with our students going out on work placement and um, showing the efficiencies of, of, of what BIM offers. Uh, we've, we've, we've had really positive feedback. Um, and like I said, colleagues coming in and upskilling in the evening courses. Um, and, and I know from, from my own experience um, working in and practice in London, I was used to Vectorworks and AutoCAD and um, it was actually on the Oman Botanic Garden. That was the first project where I was thrown into the deep end of having to use Revit. And it's a vastly complicated project with um, two biomes, five ancillary buildings and a large landscaped area. Um, and that in itself was rather daunting. Um, but I think um, as with many things, it, it, it 
you need to overcome overcome your initial fears and embrace it. Um, we were so successful in the end of connecting even our specification systems with Revit using Keynotes and Excel. Mm -hmm. And I think that became a real selling point within the company. It was something that we trialed um, and is now being run, as far as I know, um, in every large in every large project. So. Um, sorry, coming back to your original question in terms of construction, in our experience, it's not being used as much as we feel it could be, but we're hoping that step by step it will, it will come. Absolutely. And as you said, um, by educating the, the workforce, they're going to start to bring and share that knowledge with the, the, the industry. So um, again, uh, I'll be watching the space um, for, for uh, construction in Donegal to see yeah. BIM processes <laughs> and digital construction. Exactly. Um, thanks. Um, so uh, we're just about uh, at time to close um, the, um, the presentations yeah. for this afternoon. So I'd uh, just like to summarize, I suppose, that um, this has been a great regional event day. Um, we've talked about education and I've got updates from um, Sligo and Letterkenny on where um, education in digital construction and BIM um, is at. Um, we've also been updated on the implementation of BIM standards um, and then also um, got to see what's happening technology wise. Uh, so a really good um, cross section of what's happening in uh, the construction industry around the country. And I'd just like to say thank you to all of our speakers today. So thank you to Trevor, um, thank you to Connie, thank you to Willie, um, and thank you to Sosie. And um, thanks to everybody for joining today. And I'm sure you got as much out of this session as I did. Um, so really interesting presentations. Well done, everybody. And thanks um, and enjoy the rest of the um, the, the week of presentations. So thanks all. That's great. And thanks a million, Emma. You did a fantastic job of chairing the session. Really, really refreshing done. That was great. I hope you all enjoyed it. And there are three more lunchtime talks left for the rest of the week if you're interested in joining us. We had nearly 50 people online there at one stage, which was great to see such interest. So thanks again and thanks, Emma. Much appreciated. Okay. Thanks, Thank so. you, everybody. Take care. Have a good Thank week. You. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.